Hi, this is Drew. The episode you're about to listen to is actually the first of a two-part uh, episode, or two-part series, I should say, where we had Dr. Thomas Jacobson, uh, Assistant Professor of History uh, at Institute of Lutheran Theology, where I study. He came on to um, talk about uh, his areas of focus, which are very interesting, but we ended up getting into... Um, both the Nordic Reformation and then into Nordic revivalist movements. And while definitely uh, very related, are, are really uh, two different topics in themselves, um, which in themselves make for uh, great uh, study and exploration. And so we ended up just uh, uh, editing this into two episodes. So um, whenever you're listening to this, if, if you see... Uh, that that second one had been published, um, which will be on Nordic Revivals. Uh, you know, you can listen to it in whatever order you want, but um, it might be helpful to start with this one, which is on the Nordic Reformation. I hope you enjoy this episode. God bless. Good afternoon, evening, morning, whenever we find you, wherever and whenever we find you. This is Drew speaking, uh, Doth Protest Too Much, a podcast on Reformation theology and history. And um, I am joined today uh, by Dr. Thomas Jacobson, actually the Reverend Dr. Thomas Jacobson, to be correct. Um, uh, Thomas Jacobson is a uh, well, he holds a PhD from Luther Seminary as well as an MDiv. That's Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. And he is a pastor at Grace Lutheran Church. And he is also, uh, for several years now, been um, on faculty at the Institute of Lutheran Theology, where yours truly does uh, his doctoral work. And um, he was named assistant professor of history there in 2020, but has taught church history courses there in some some shape or form um, since uh, 2012. So uh, it's always great to have someone from ILT on. And uh, our listeners, you know, uh, obviously don't know because we had a kind of a pre-show conversation. Uh, Dr. Jacobson and I haven't, we've rarely interacted Uh he he's taught courses that I have not been in and I'm in kind of the kind of the later stages of a PhD program where I've been working with I, I'm basically working with one person now at this point and then then a committee but yeah um so I haven't got to meet all the faculty but I'm glad uh Dr. Jacobson to be with you for this for this uh session together on this podcast how are you today I'm doing great coming to you from the great town of Thornville Ohio and I've been serving at Grace Lutheran Church here for almost two years now. Um, it's kind of a bit of an, a stretch for me because I spent most of my life in Minnesota and the Dakotas, and uh, but the opportunity came to serve out here in central Ohio, not too far from Columbus, and so mm -hmm. that's where we find ourselves now, but uh, I'm glad to be here with you today. It's a wonderful fall afternoon. Well, I imagine that's 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 a change to adapt to, and I'm I'm I apologize. I I mentioned the church you served at, but not where it was. Yeah, Thornville, Ohio. I do remember, um, you know, and yeah, that is a change coming from Dakotas, Minnesota. That's that is like that's the real upper Midwest, right? Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, I'm from Michigan and <laughs> did seminary in Ohio, and I and the most west I've got was Wisconsin because I have family there, but um. Yeah, I've actually never. I was in Minnesota for the very first time this year. I was on a I was on a layover. I don't even know if a layover counts. I didn't leave the airport, but um, yeah, I'd never been to the Dakotas, even though I studied at a school in South Dakota. So um, that's uh, I, I imagine is just just from the though I haven't been there, I get the vibe from the people there, and and yeah, I, I would imagine it's a bit different from yeah Central Ohio, which I do know a little bit about, but uh, you know. But um, it is uh, it is ethnically different for sure. Um, yeah, out here the the that ethnicity is pretty strongly German in heritage. Yeah, uh, when you get further west, uh, obviously Minnesota has a 
strong German background as well, but uh, there's a much stronger Scandinavian contingent uh, in those states than there is out this area. So I'm kind of a kind of an outlier here, but uh, people here tolerate me, and they're glad to hear some of my some of my interest in uh, Norway and Denmark, especially. Yeah. Well, you know, and a lot of people might not think about that. Like for me, coming from Michigan, living in a place like Louisiana, that's very much night and day in many ways. But um, yeah, a lot of people might not realize, you know, going from a place like Minnesota or Dakotas to Ohio, that in itself is a sort of culture shock. We, I mean, and you think like ethnic, when people think of ethnicity today, they think of, you know, black, white and shades between and whatever. But, you know, there it this the Germanic roots, the Scandinavian roots, while been planted a couple hundred years or maybe less even, um, they still carry on in certain ways, just in the mannerisms, how we interact, you know, um, that's, that's definitely true. And um, yeah, so that's, but, but my prayers and blessings with you as you, as you continue in, in, as a stranger in a new land. <laughs> so I definitely know that feeling being a, michigan person in louisiana but um and i don't know if you intentionally brought up that that piece about scandinavian heritage because i did not mention to our listeners this is a perfect segue uh our topic for today is on um well scandinavian lutheranism basically but i guess where um because a lot of our podcast has been well it's reformationally focused for one and so luther gets a lot of attention luther's a german um, and the Reformation comes initially out of something in Germany with Luther. And of course, uh, we talk a lot about the English side of that being being an Anglican host. And uh, James, of course, who comes on a lot is an Anglican. But um, I will admit my ignorance. And I my last name's Christensen, which is Scandinavian. I mean, it's Danish, right? And e- Either Danish or Norwegian. Yeah. So with a name like mine, I'm ashamed to say I'm very ignorant of not just Scandinavian Lutheranism, but also just that the history in general of the Nordic lands, the kingdoms of the North. Right. And so I'm uh, today's podcast. I'm kind of um, I didn't do much research out because I thought it'd be more interesting if I just, you know, ask some kind of basic foundational questions about, you know, what, what is this expression of Christ of Lutheran Christianity, of course, um, that comes out of uh, these these regions of the world, Scandinavia, and then um, a lot of that does play a part uh, through the migration waves, the immigration into North America. Um, and so my first question uh, to you is, well, I guess, how did you become interested in, I mean, it, I, you, I know you're very conscious, at least at this point, as, as we're speaking of your heritage and, you know, it's, it's definitely a part of where you're from, but how did you get interested? Well, I guess in ministry or what led you in an MDiv and then what led you into the academic study of history? Well, that's a big question. I first got interested in ministry in the church when I was in high school and I kind of fell into it. Um, I was not the most likely candidate uh, to be interested in serving in the church. Why? I, is that? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off already, but <laughs> that is interesting. I wasn't either. Well, what what what's the reasons behind your? <laughs> well, I I was a bit uh, cynical for various reasons uh, with my upbringing, and I went through confirmation in my Lutheran church there in my hometown in Minnesota, and uh, didn't really take much of it to heart. But I do remember on my confirmation day in 1995, and I was sitting there, and the pastor stood up in front, and he made a comment, and he said, yeah, this is a good group of kids, and there were a lot of us there. There were 26 of us, I think, in my confirmation class, and he said, yeah, this is a, this is a good group of kids, and I'm sure there are going to be at least four of them that become pastors. And I remember sitting there and thinking to myself, what would that be like? And I said, he can't possibly be talking about me. So I kind of put it out of my mind, but I've never forgotten that moment. And a few months down the line, I don't know what it was that uh, got me interested in picking up my Bible that I had gotten in third grade and got interested in reading it. And it just... uh, 
the interest developed and continued. And I thought, you know, I think that might be what I want to do. Uh, a lot of people dismissed that and they said, oh, I think it's highly unlikely that you'll end up doing that. But I uh, I proved them wrong. Uh, so I went to college uh, after I graduated from high school. Uh, in the fall after that, I was down at Augustana College, now University, uh, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I knew from the start that that's what I was going to focus on. So I studied German and uh, theology, religion, mm -hmm. uh, languages, classical studies, things like that. I knew that's what I was going to get involved in. So I prepared myself and... I remember it was my spring semester that first year of college that I had my Western Civilization II class, and I was wondering about a topic to research. And so I, I decided for whatever reason, I just kind of fell into it, that um, I wanted to explore early Lutheran history in America. So I got mixed up with some of the Scandinavian uh, materials written by a historian named Abdul Ross Wentz. Um, he was a historian uh, based out of, I think, Philadelphia Seminary or Gettysburg Seminary, I think. Uh, but he's a very famous American Lutheran scholar of the previous generations. And so I remember reading Wentz's uh, history of Lutheranism in America and getting interested about the Norwegian piece of this and how it fit into the formation of Augustana College, where I was studying. Uh, so I got interested in it at that point and kind of put it out of my mind. But then when I decided to go back to graduate school and get into the PhD program, um, I decided to, to make that my main area of focus, um, partially because it's not an area that a lot of attention has been given to in recent mm -hmm. years. Yeah. So I wanted to fill a void and, you know, selfishly in a way, uh, if you write about a topic where there isn't a whole lot of work that's been done. It gives you the freedom to do a lot of original research and you don't have to plow a whole lot of new ground. You can plow that. I mean, you don't have to struggle to plow new ground. You can sort of have the freedom to explore. And uh, that was a, that was um, tempting to me. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I wouldn't see it as selfish. I mean, we, it's neat. I mean, areas with not much, research done of course you know eventually i believe needs need people to too as you said fill that void and so i mean you're doing a service in a way but i mean if you're if you're finding fulfillment and enjoyment out of it gosh i mean what a, what a win um mm -hmm. you know uh yeah so um you know when i think of scandinavian lutheranism and like i said a moment ago i'm very ignorant to it um, but from what I know about it, um, I guess a more recent theological voice of that is um, not recent. He's in the 20th century is uh, Bogirts, Borgirts. I know he's pronounced differently. He's he he sent he, he tends to have, you know, a lot of Anglo-American, you know, uh, he's got a lot of fans on in that in the Anglo world uh, and in the Lutheran world. But also, you know, I'm an Episcopalian. I like Bogirts a lot. He's come up on this podcast, but outside, when I generally think about Scandinavian Lutheranism, I think of, and this might not be fully accurate, but I think of a high church or higher church form of Lutheranism. Um, and I think like, for instance, the Episcopal church of which I'm a priest and we're in full communion with the church of Sweden. And this was out, if I'm remembering the history, right, this is outside of like, um, you know, the agreement we got had with the ELCA of being in full communion with the ELCA Lutheran Church in the in the US. Um, and it's outside of other Anglican Lutheran dialogues or whatnot. It, I believe this was something that came about like, like the Episcopal Church, like the the province of the Episcopal Church in this worldwide Anglican community. Uh, that particular church has some type of very particular agreement with Church of Sweden. I could be wrong on that, and that's what the show notes are for to correct things. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, but the but either way, I know the Church of Sweden has had at least a type of relationship with Anglicanism in general uh, historically. And if you look at if you were to Google a picture of clergy and uh, or a liturgy, a church service in the Church of Sweden, um, it looks like. Um, 
kind of like a high church Anglican um, setting with, and the bishops wear mitres and the priests wear all the vestments and everything. And, and so um, I guess the, what being, being a, an Episcopalian though, who doesn't see himself as I'm not an Anglo Catholic as, and, and anyone who's listened to this podcast for more than like an episode will definitely know that um, it's interesting that there is high church Lutheranism and high church Anglicanism are both definitely phenomena that have a similarity perhaps aesthetically but theologically are there's a contrast because high church lutheranism still i think is is evangelical in its doctrine and and its teaching of the justification by faith while some of the high church anglican especially in the anglo-catholic scene um has forsaken that because and they've um because they see it as a flawed reformational thing and um mm-hmm. so I mean, that's just kind of my observation um a lot more nuance to that i simplified it a bit but um but yeah i just know scandinavian lutheranism is higher church and it, that it retained perhaps well for if for one pertained uh the office of the bishop while lutheranism in germany i would i think for the most part if not completely did not um so it, what are some care what are if you want to describe some character, what are some contrasts, like characteristics, the ethos? Is there an ethos of like Lutheranism in the Nordic countries? That's different from the Lutheranism in the countries below it, the Germanic ones. Okay, that's a open-ended question, but I'll, I'll tackle a lot of the issues that you've raised here. Uh, one of the things I want to note first is that a very fascinating book, and I think it's probably the best book on the subject, uh, if you're looking at just a history of Lutheranism, uh, the book is long out of print, but it was written by, actually by a Swedish-American uh, Lutheran historian, Konrad Bergendorf. Uh, his book is called The Church of the Lutheran Reformation. And um, so he he came out of the Swedish Lutheran background in America, what was eventually what eventually became the Augustana Evangelical Lutheran Church. Uh, but Bergendorf's book is really well done. And one of the things he points out at the beginning is that when people think of Lutheranism, naturally they gravitate toward thinking of Germany and the German background. And one of the myths that he tries to dispel at the beginning of the book is that Lutheranism should not be understood primarily, exclusively as a German phenomenon. Uh, He points out the fact that Lutheranism is, a a lot of the strength of Lutheranism in America and around the world has been supported by the Nordic expressions of Lutheranism. Um, So the way that a lot of things developed in these countries, um, you know, you you talked about the Swedish situation. Lutheranism in the Nordic countries, and and I say Nordic rather than Scandinavian, because Scandinavia tends to refer specifically to Norway, Denmark, Sweden, perhaps Iceland and the Faroe Islands and other related territories like that. Uh, Finland is a bit of a different story. Uh, The Finnish language is unrelated to the other Scandinavian languages, which are generally mutually intelligible. Uh, Some people in those countries might dispute that, but for the most part, they're pretty much the same. I mean, Norwegians can talk to Swedes depending on what part of the country they're from. And the Danes are a little bit harder for both of them to understand, but it can be done if there's a will for it. Um, But there is a significant Swedish speaking minority in Finland. And part of that is due to the fact that Finland was for many years a province of Sweden. So when we think about Lutheranism in the Nordic countries. The best way to think about it is to think of it in two separate kinds of experiences. One would be the Dano-Norwegian tradition, which also includes the Icelandic situation. And then the other one is to think of it Sweden and Finland. Uh, How things developed in those countries, in those two sort of expressions, uh, they differ from each other a little bit. Uh, You're right in saying that as the Reformation developed in Germany, uh, the office of bishop, as it was understood in the sense of Episcopal succession, uh, that was phased out. Uh, Some might argue, perhaps because just practicality, uh, that there were no bishops who really 
participated in the Reformation in that sense. But it was also, as we see the Reformation spread further north, uh, there was what appears to be a conscious decision, at least in the Danish situation, um, to phase out that understanding of the office of bishop. Um, Martin Luther's uh, co-worker and Martin Luther's confessor pastor, uh, Johannes Bugenhagen, uh, traveled north to Denmark uh, as the Reformation ideas began to spread into Schleswig-Holstein, which is today a part of Germany, but at the time was a duchy connected to the Kingdom of Denmark. Uh, Bugenhagen went north in the 1530s, and he was there for the purpose of organizing the church as the Reformation took hold. And what Bugenhagen did in Denmark was they eliminated the office of bishop uh, from the Roman church, and he instead installed a series of superintendents uh, in the place of bishops. Now, the superintendents were, you know, ecclesiastical administrators, you know, in charge of territories, but... Uh, I'm sorry, this is in Denmark? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they did, and uh, so things took hold in Norway in a very similar way, because at the time, Norway was a province of Denmark. I was kind of on the uh, fringes of Europe at the time, uh, one of the poorer areas of Europe, and it would remain so uh, for a time, which is interesting to see, because because today, Norway is one of the wealthiest countries in Europe. And <laughs> uh, But that's what happened is uh, the Reformation, especially in Norway, was pretty much imposed from above. Uh, there wasn't a huge popular demand for it. Uh, but evangelical superintendents were installed in different parts of the country. And, uh, you know, they gradually began that process of embracing Reformation principles. And it would take several generations for that to take hold because there's evidence from sermons uh, that are preached even as late as the, the 1570s that uh, these preachers are admonishing their their listeners not to pray to the saints and so forth. Uh, so the way that things developed in the Dano-Norwegian situation, um, it, it would continue to be a constant point of contact between Denmark and Norway. A lot of these significant uh, church leaders in the Norwegian Lutheran situation uh, came from Denmark. And, uh, you know, they, the the superintendent of Bergen, Norway, for example, was from, from Denmark. Um, uh, the way that things developed in Sweden and Finland... So before we get to Sweden and Finland, I'm finding this fascinating, by the way. I mean, this is like, you know, it's like when you're learning a new thing that's interesting. That's what I'm going through right now, because I'm so used to reading more in depth of the things I've already known. I mm -hmm. just love getting a good 101 though on something I'm it's this is very fascinating. The um so staying first a little bit longer with this this Danish Norway, because it's good to couple those those situations together. Norway and, and Denmark represent the sphere of of something that goes on historically in the Reformation. I had one of the impressions I did have of Scandinavian Lutheranism, and it seems to be true in this Norway situation you just described, is that the Reformation was very much a top-down thing. Um you said it seems like there was some and and there's a parallel with England um, there's you know um, there was resistance in England depending on what part not everywhere to uh, reforming efforts that were being pushed down from it wouldn't be superintendents but actual bishops um, so so you so it it was it a, was it would it be too simplistic to say it was a top down thing in Norway Sweden or is it kind of is it kind of fair to say it was it was largely that? Well, in Denmark, the way that things developed is there was some kind of popular movement for reform that took place that that sparked this. Uh, there were some significant Danish reformers. Uh, there was a guy named uh, Hans Mikkelsen. Uh, there was a man named Hans Tausen. He was kind of like the kind of like the reformer of Denmark, Hans Tausen. Hans Mikkelsen is the man who helped to produce the Danish version of the Bible, which uh, was modeled after Luther's translation of uh, the Bible. Uh, it wasn't maybe as based upon the original languages as much as Luther's was. Uh, 
but uh, he filled a uh, role in, in Danish church life uh, in that way. But there were uh, actually one of the things that kind of provided a, a gateway to the Reformation in Denmark was that there were these preachers were not necessarily when, when you look at their theology, they, it, it wasn't exactly Lutheran. Uh, it was humanist preaching um, focused on reform of the church, but humanist in the sense that they they focused on the freedom of the human will and other such things. Uh, but these people were considered to be Lutheran because they were active around the time of the Reformation. Uh, but this opened up to people like Hans Tausen uh, having a more uh, confessional type Lutheran preaching. But the one thing that I would say uh, that caused the situation in Scandinavia, at least the Dano-Norwegian situation, to differ from what happened in, in Germany, is that eventually as the Lutheran confessional writings come to be finalized, you know, by 1580, uh, the king of Denmark at the time, uh, many people expected him to receive, you know, this uh, formula of Concord that had been hammered out in 1577, uh, expected him to receive it with open arms. Well, it didn't exactly happen that way. Uh, he actually, upon receipt of it, he uh, he had copies of the formula of Concord burned. Uh, and this was really for political reasons as, as much as theological. Uh, Part of it was because he just didn't feel that the formula of Concord, which, of course, as you know, uh, deals with lots of uh, intra-Lutheran disputes, uh, in specific condemnations of other types of Christian confessions. Uh, he didn't feel that was necessary. He didn't feel it was relevant to their situation. He felt it was a German type thing. And practically, he didn't want to adhere to a confessional standard like that that could potentially alienate other Protestant allies mm -hmm. in places like England and the Netherlands. Uh, and so he's like, we don't need this. So the formula of Concord was burned. And so the confessional basis of the Dano-Norwegian Lutheran tradition really was basically the Augsburg Confession of 1530 and then Martin Luther's small catechism. Okay. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily that the theology was so repugnant to them, but it just felt it was not necessary. So uh, that really set kind of the standard, especially, and this is, becomes important for American Lutheran history too, because the churches that come out of the, the Norwegian Lutheran situation, they uh, did not really have as a part of their history, uh, officially subscribing to the entire book of Concord right. on their confessional basis, whereas the German synods did. Yeah. Um... So I couldn't help but see like a parallel with, you know, when you get into the, the England side of the Reformation, before um, the English Reformation was in the fullest swing, I guess you could say, before the, thir you know, definitely before like the 39 articles were written, you know, you had really a a century worth of, of, um, of kind of, they're called proto-reformers and even uh, up through Tyndale. And I know Erasmus is not English, but he ends up there at some point, and he had a big influence on England. Um, they were also very humanistic, and of course, that's that's the crux of the Erasmus Luther dispute of is yeah. the free will part. Um, and and so um, it sounds like to me, I, I didn't know about the Bugenhagen part. One of my questions I, I was thinking of asking was like, you know, what brought reforming, uh, what what brought reformational thought to, to the Nordic countries in the or first place. And it sounds like you're saying Bugenhagen came to maybe standardize in some form, you know, so someone from Luther's circle, the Wittenberg circle goes up there to, to, you know, okay, this is the right spirit of what we should be doing, but, but not some of these other things. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a bad character, but, but he goes up there, but it sounds like something was already, uh, uh, fermenting before as far as like there was already like in england for instance i know cramner and the white horse in they were importing 
works of Luther and what was going on in the continent was something similar, like similar to that happening in the Nordic countries, well, at least in the, the Dano uh, Norwegian situation, was it just starting to trickle up there? Or, you know, yeah, I mean, th there were people from the Nordic lands who were connected with the University of Wittenberg. And so there were people, um, one of the guys who was um, Christian the uh, second, he was a bit of a controversial figure. And he's the guy who was actually responsible for Norway's status or secondary status. Um, Christian the second from Denmark um, had been present in Wittenberg, and he might have actually been present at uh, the Diet of Worms in 1521. Um, he had some sympathies originally to what Luther was saying. And, uh, but then eventually, um, uh, he was deposed of his, his throne, and he apparently had reconverted then to the Roman church, and he attempted to return to Denmark through Norway, uh, but he was actually captured, and as a result of that, uh, the Norwegians were punished for uh, aiding him, so... Things like this, uh, th there were people connected to, uh, you know, the, the spirit of the reform movement was active in parts of northern Germany as well. And through that entered into Schleswig-Holstein, which today is a part of Germany, but uh, historically was connected more with Denmark. And it was through there that um, the Schleswig-Holstein region was the first, technically the first land of the Nordic countries uh, to embrace the Reformation. Um, and after that, uh, things kind of trickled further north into the, the heart of Danish country. Uh, when it comes, however, just transitioning a little bit to the Swedish and the Finnish situation, the, the students that Luther had in Wittenberg uh, provided a direct access you know, to those countries. A man named Olavos Petri, uh, he's been described as the Martin Luther of Sweden, and he studied with uh, with Luther. Uh, also, Mikael Agricola, he was uh, Finnish, and he had studied there as well. And so those two in particular influenced their their situation. So there's a direct, much more direct access. You can clearly see the the tracing there. Yeah. 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 There really is no equivalent. I mean, in the Nor Norwegian situation, uh, there was one guy named Jürgen Eriksson who became the superintendent of Stavanger, Norway. Uh, some people have cl claimed that he should be considered the Martin Luther of Norway, but uh, his influence is not nearly as deep and wide as that of Olavus Petri in Sweden. Um, but in the Swedish situation, uh, the king of, of Sweden, uh, Gustavus Vasa, more than anything, um, what led him to try to sever ties with the Roman church was not so much theology, but the fact that the church owned a ton of the land in Sweden. And he simply desired a national run church. And so uh, in stages, but I think by 1527, uh, Gustavus Vasa had severed ties with the Roman church. Uh, but when he did, he actually, the, the church largely continued doing the same administrative things. Uh, the offices of the bishop and the priests, they, they kept on doing the same thing. And uh, Olavus Petri gradually began to introduce Reformation ideas into the Swedish church. Now, this is something that happened kind of by accident. Uh, but the tradition of the Episcopal uh, structure uh, of the church ended up being retained in Sweden uh, for that reason. And uh, actually, all of us, Petri's brother, Laurentius Petri, was ordained as the Archbishop of uh, 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 the Archbishop of um, Stockholm, I believe. And so he became the head of the, the Swedish church. I mean, the king was really the head, but uh, but the bishop was the, the archbishop was the, the spiritual leader of the church. And uh, so this was done basically kind of by accident, but the tradition of Episcopal succession continued in the Swedish church uh, for this reason. And that's the reason why the connection with the Anglican communion and Sweden is what it is. Uh, in Finland as well, the tradition that tradition was retained. Um, so 
really, I, I would argue that the Swedish church actually has a better claim to that tradition of apostolic succession than actually the English church does, uh, given the history behind the uh, the English Civil War and and all right. Robert Cromwell and everything. <laughs> and that's for those of us who are even concerned with defining apostolic succession right. as being able, you know, for me, it's the carrying on of the the, the kerygma, not the... Uh, Right. It's it's great that we if we can verify um the generations, but you know, um I think that's that's secondary, uh, you know. <laughs> so the other thing yeah. I'll add too, um, along with the Swedish situation, is that the whole issue of confessional subscription is kind of a it's kind of nebulous in the Swedish situation for many years. So the Swedish church had been independent from Rome from fairly early on in the time of the Reformation. But it wasn't until the year 1593, I believe, that they formally accepted the Augsburg Confession as a confessional standard for their church. So only, you know, for several decades, they were not officially Lutheran. I mean, however you define what that means. But, you know, they were rooted in what they understood as Reformation theology, as preached by Olivus Patry. But they formalized that finally in 15. 93. Um, and Finland, you know, Finland being a province of Sweden, as it was, uh, kind of adopted the same sort of situation. And Mikhail Agricola became the chief reformer of Finland. But that's kind of an interesting case, because Finland was probably the last country in Europe to actually be Christianized at all. And they'd only really been a Christian country for about a hundred years by the time of the Reformation. So, um, yeah, that's that's a lot of change, <laughs> so. right? And you know the the translation of the Bible in Finnish when they made it uh, Old Testament references to the Canaanite gods, for example, the Baals and Asherah and Molech and all of these Old Testament. Uh, deities worshipped by these people. Uh, when they translated the Bible to Finnish, they actually substituted the names uh, of these Finnish gods, the Finnish pantheon, uh, in, in place of those Canaanite gods as a way of trying to emphasize to the people uh, that the Christian God is superior. So That is interesting, yeah. I guess a useful way of... Uh you know, <laughs> Christianizing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and apologize, I'm jumping forward a little bit first off, and this might be another kind of big question, but I'm curious because um, you, you're uh, the expert really on, on, on North American Lutheran history. What, you know, fast forwarding now to the American situation where we have, you know, our present Lutheran church bodies, Lutheran denominations in North America, the big ones, of course, being the ELCA and the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, and then, of course, you have an ALC, LCMC, and you have the alphabet soup, as people joke. Um, how much of these bodies, are they all influenced by the Scandinavian situation? I mean, do how are all these bodies comprised in some form of 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 having Scandinavian roots? Well, that's hard to break down, it, and it's hard to say, because, of course, you have individuals that are connected to these churches. Um, but most of the Scandinavian or Nordic church bodies, synods, that became a part of American church life, uh, most of these bodies ended up eventually joining, you know, the merger process that resulted in the formation of the ELCA, in 1988. Um, and then, of course, when NALC was formed in 2010, LCMC, uh, 10 years prior to that, uh, those groups also had significant representation from congregations that came out of those Scandinavian-based uh, bodies. Uh, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, of course, uh, the roots of that are in a particular form of German-American Lutheranism. Uh, they were a very successful German-based group originally. Um, and that's a big part of their heritage. But there were also many German synods that eventually became part of what today is the ELCA, and then the splinters from it. Uh, 
But interestingly, in the Missouri Synod, uh, they have absorbed a few groups over the years that uh, have become a part of their organization. Uh, so in, I believe it was, I believe it was in the 19, sometime in the 1960s, there was a small Finnish American Lutheran group called the Finnish National Lutheran Church. And that officially joined the Missouri Synod at that point. So that is a part of the Missouri Synod's life. Uh, and then in the 1970s, this isn't Nordic, of course, but a Slovak group uh, officially joined the Missouri Synod in the 1970s. Um, so I would say that overall, uh, the, the Missouri Synod is not terribly influenced by the Scandinavian background. However, one of the guys that became uh, well, probably arguably the most significant president of the Missouri Synod back in uh, the late 1960s, uh, Jack Preuss, or Jacob Preuss, uh, he had been a part of, he came out of the Norwegian background. And uh, so he became a part of the group that uh, was known as the Evangelical Lutheran Synod today. And the Preuss family is a big name in American, uh, Norwegian American Lutheran history. Uh, Jack Preuss was the cousin of David Preuss. Uh, David Preuss became the president of the American Lutheran Church, uh, which had been formed originally in 1960 as a merger of the large Norwegian contingent of what was called the Evangelical Lutheran Church. And then there was the slightly smaller American Lutheran Church, which was German, what my congregation here used to be a part of. Yeah. Uh, and then a small Danish Lutheran group called the uh, United Evangelical Lutheran Church. But uh, Jack and David were cousins. And so at one point, uh, two thirds of American Lutherans were ruled by the Preusses. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I remember yeah. reading um, in seminary, I, you know, I didn't get, uh, and I know in our pre-show conversation, I told you, about, but the last time, I mean, I, I, as much as I, I'm a student more of reformational history in general and, and, and a lot of Luther's thought, um, I did kind of dabble into American Lutheran history for a little bit when I was in seminary. And I remember um, reading, yeah, I mean, Jack Preuss was president of, president of Missouri City and David Preuss of ALC. During some interesting years at the same time, there was that overlap. It was would have been during the time of Seminex, also during the time of when Missouri Synod and ALC had fellowship for a duration, certain duration. And then that they ended they ended up parting ways. And I Preusses were both at the helm still when they, if I'm not mistaken, when they parted ways, which must have made for some interesting Thanksgiving conversation thanksgiving yeah. uh family dinner conversations but um so yeah that is that the preuss family and their history with lutheranism adds a very interesting sometimes dramatic uh uh history to read um and yeah and i know for our listeners i know we've been we've been mentioning all these different lutheran bodies that have emerged over american history elca is the merging of origin of uh, three bodies but before that there were those three lutheran denominations had were at least a couple of them were the merging of other small bodies so there were all these immigration waves from from the nordic side from the german side of of lutheranism into america and they all it's just it's a very complicated complex history that you really got to trace but um it's kind of simplified for us now only you know there being a handful of really of Lutheran church bodies as opposed to a lot more, but, um, right. and at that being two really major ones, but my, uh, I mean, you know, and, and my, a lot of my family was Missouri Synod, but my stepmom and her whole side out of, uh, very, they're very German family, very in, in Franken, in Frankish, and they were ALC is also very dramatic. So, um, yeah, fascinating stuff. I, I was going to ask you, um, and that, folks, is the conclusion of our first part of these two episodes. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, towards the end of that episode, I apologize because my voice, uh, as I do when I get interested and, and passionate about something or, or it, when I just get comfortable and casual with the conversation, my voice tends to go up and it goes down and, and, and I might start talking fast and things like that. And so I apologize if the last 
minute of that, I was a little unclear because as I listened to the audio, it seemed kind of unclear to me. But what I was saying was that, um, you know, a lot of my family, my Lutheran roots in my family are a lot of it's Missouri Synod. But uh, my stepmom, Rachel, shout out, love you. Uh, same name as my wife, but my stepmom is R-A-C-H-E-L and my wife is R-A-C-H-A-E-L. But my stepmom, uh, her side of the family, she was raised in Frankenmuth, Michigan which is a historic German settlement, but a very touristy little town now nowadays in Saginaw, Michigan. If you've been there, they have the world's largest uh, Christmas store. I think it's one of its kind of claims to fame. But also there's a cool ice sculpture fest uh, that takes place in the winter. And in the summer, you can go ride on the riverboat there. And my, my brother Kyle actually worked on the riverboat for some time. And he also worked at the clock shop there. So uh, I have some, you know, I have some connection to that place. And uh, it's, it's a neat little place uh, if, if you feel like a little little Bavarian vibe. So, um, but, but she grew up there and she was ALC. And ALC was that church body, which was, uh, uh, we, we mentioned it was a uh, Germanic, I suppose, but it was the merging in 1960 of several smaller Lutheran bodies, including that Norwegian body that we spent a lot of time talking about. And of course, the ALC formed in 1960 would then merge in the 80s into the ELCA, which is the uh, the, the large kind of mainline Protestant Lutheran church body. So um, that's just a little bit of the clarification. I know it's confusing with all these different, um, as I said, the complicated history with the on the denomination side of where all these people have come from. But I hope you uh, enjoyed the episode. Uh, we have never really focused on the Nordic um, history before, and it, well as how it uh, how it came into the states. And uh, we look forward to our next episode where Dr. Jacobson will be talking about uh, not Nordic Reformation, but Nordic revivalist movements. Yeah, similar to um, you know revivalist movements on this continent and in, you know England with Wesley. Well, there was a form of that in the continent of Europe. Um, often known as pietism and dr jacobson will have some helpful com- we'll have some helpful co- helpful conversation on that um looking at it in a more positive light than maybe some of the negative characters that have been made of it uh but um and just the influence it also had on north american not only north american you know lutheran denominations but actually communities in north america in several states um in 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 the north and in the upper midwest region and so uh god bless hope you enjoyed it and we uh, love all our listeners we're excited for you to tune in again